At the heart of Europe lies Switzerland. It's a surprisingly big little country. Small in area, but big on natural beauty. And like its many languages and cultures, its landscapes vary widely too. From mighty Alps and dense forests to mysterious moors and roaring waterfalls. Switzerland has many faces, some familiar, some hidden. It's a country that's astonishingly rich in variety, wilderness, and scenic wonder. Sometimes beauty is not apparent at first glance. Things are not always as they seem. Some regions in Switzerland are less well known, so now is the time to discover them. This tree keeps its real age a secret. Known as Le Chêne de Bosse, the gnarled oak, it's said to have witnessed the changing of the seasons over a thousand times here in the Swiss Jura. The Jura encompasses the entire low mountain region stretching from the northeast of Switzerland along the French border right down to Lake Geneva. The Jura is synonymous with time. It's given its name to an entire global epoch and is also home to traditional horological craftsmanship. There are traces of time or times gone by everywhere. The Jura Mountains are a kind of little brother to the Alps. Compared to the rest of Switzerland, the entire region is quite sparsely populated. That's why there's one thing in abundance here, peace and quiet. Usually that is, but right now it's spring in the northern Jura and that means the mating season. The trees are alive with a chirping song contest. It's a musical competition for the favor of the females. They decide whether a male is a worthwhile breeding partner or not. Evidently, this nuthatch passed the test. In addition to their reproductive instinct, animals have one other overpowering driving force, hunger. The ermine moves as fast as lightning. But life at this pace takes a lot of energy, which means food. Mice are a favorite food. In the past, ermines were often kept as pets to keep farms free of mice. Because no mouse is safe anywhere near an ermine. One unguarded moment and death is at the door. Death and life, the eternal cycle of nature. Under the first warming rays of sunshine, snowdrops and crocuses are the first to venture forth. 
Other flowers follow swiftly, like the cuckoo flower. And when these buds open, a touch of the Orient unfolds in the middle of Switzerland. Because later, they will result in a very special fruit, the damson plum. Legend has it that these Damascene plums were a souvenir brought back by the Crusaders from Damascus in Syria over 800 years ago. Its integration was a success. Today, it's a Swiss speciality and is enjoyed especially in high-proof liquid form. Growing alongside them are apples, cherries and mirabelle plums. It's no coincidence that the Jurassic Ajoie is known as the fruit orchard of Western Switzerland. For the blossoms to become delicious fruit, however, a specific interaction is necessary, one that has worked for hundreds of millions of years. Blossoms aren't stingy with their charms in spring. Scent, color, and shape, they use the lot to lure their pollinators. And it works. Bees need huge quantities of nectar and pollen to feed the brood in their hives. As they go, pollen grains get stuck to their bee fur and are carried from flower to flower. Bees are also true to a single variety. They remain with the plant species until the blossoms fade. It's a great advantage for fruit trees if only their own pollen dust is carried about. Plant or animal kingdom, new life is springing up everywhere. Here too in the nearby forests around the old Chateau Plejouz. A whole pack of young foxes enjoys some unsupervised time. Their mother has probably gone off looking for food, as these four to five week old cubs can't do that yet. They still have no idea how serious life is. Hunters, cars, there are many dangers out there in the big wide world, but right now, that doesn't concern them. Fun and games are the privilege of childhood. Today, mountains rise up in the place where the Tethys Ocean lay in prehistoric times. Deposits of sediment led to the formation of limestone. One could say that the Jura Mountains are underpinned by the remains of seashells, corals, and crabs. The characteristic cast formations of the limestone mountains aroused the interest of nature researcher Alexander von Humboldt. He named these rock strata after the place where they were discovered, Jura. Later, this name was adopted to describe the entire period of their creation. Almost as if a giant had left footprints. Funnels in the ground like these appear unexpectedly in karst areas. Called dolines, they're formed by the corrosive dissolving of rock in rainwater. This is also how subterranean karst formations are created, better known as stalactite caves. So far, 9,000 caves have been discovered in Switzerland, most of them in the Jura. One of these is the Reclair cave. It affords a glimpse into the mysterious bowels of the earth, as well as a journey into the deepest mists of the past. Time seems to have stood still here.
stalactites grow at a rate of about 8 to 15 millimeters every 100 years. Drip by drip, sculptures are formed. The water evaporates, a wafer-thin lime deposit remains. Over millions of years, this process has created the astonishing works of art that fire our imagination today. Stalactites grow down from the ceiling. To start with, they form thin tubes. Because of this peculiar shape, they're called macaroni. Some of the stalagmites reaching up from the floor of the cave are more reminiscent of cannelloni. Reclair is where Switzerland's largest stalagmite reigns supreme. Known as the cathedral, it's some 15 meters tall and so is thought to be around 200,000 years old. In the cave, the temperature is a constant 7 degrees centigrade all year round. For some, these are ideal conditions in which to spend winter. Eleven species of bat use the frost-free caves as their winter quarters. From November, when food becomes scarce, they retreat to the caves and go into a kind of hibernation to save valuable energy. Among them are the lesser and greater horseshoe bat, both of which are on the endangered list. For them to be woken now would be fatal, which is why the caves are closed to the public during winter. Much less well-known than bats are the inhabitants of the subterranean lake. You have to look really carefully to spot them. Nifagus, a freshwater crustacean. About the size of a thumbnail, they feed partly on the remains of creatures who've strayed into the cave and got lost there, such as toads or mice. interplay of water and time. Its impressive results can be observed on the Earth's surface too. For millions of years, the Du River has coursed its way through the limestone, until a landslide blocked its way some 14,000 years ago. The result, the Lac des Brenets. Like a fjord, the lake winds its way between steep walls up to 80 meters high. At the Du Falls, the water cascades with tremendous force into the valley below. The waterfall has another feature. It also forms the border between Switzerland and France. For almost 500 kilometers, the River Du snakes backwards and forwards between France and Switzerland, as if it were unable to make up its mind where to go. In some places, the high rock walls make it almost inaccessible, so it's pristine, untouched by human influence. But there are also flatter stretches. This makes it flow at different rates, in some places very fast, and others more sedately. In between, it seems to pause and rest in peaceful pools. 
The area is home to black kites. They often frequent places near water so they can catch fish. This kite has caught something else. What it intends to do with this branch isn't entirely clear. Probably use it for nest building. Right now, it's breeding time for black kites in the Jura. It's a migrating bird and spends the winter in Africa. From March to September, it returns to Switzerland. The kite is a master of the art of gliding using the smallest updraft to conserve strength. The River Du has plentiful fish reserves to provide the kite and other birds with the food they need to survive. But their idyll is at risk. The Du has a serious problem with environmental pollution. Agriculture, industry and hydroelectric power plants all contribute to the threat posed to the river's abundant fish stocks. There are still areas that look almost untouched, where the dew still provides a valuable habitat. especially as breeding grounds for waterfowl, on the banks or in the lake, where coots build their floating nests using twigs and water plants. The mute swan prefers to nest on the river banks. Its young could hardly be called ugly ducklings, though. It's never too early to start getting a bit of beauty sleep. The chicks stay with their parents for eight to nine months before they're independent. It's lunchtime for this family. With its long neck, the adult dives for aquatic plants deep underwater, the staple diet for swans, big or small. Nature conservationists have been trying to protect this paradise for years. They might succeed if especially the hydroelectric power plants are willing to reduce their use of the river. Whether that will happen remains to be seen. On some days, the moisture in the river valley draws skeins of fog across the landscape. This is good for the neighboring forests and fields. The juicy grass provides food for the region's large cattle herds. Many people here make a living from agriculture. The milk is turned into the Jura's famous cheeses, such as Tete de Moine. In the advancing early summer, whatever hasn't been eaten or mowed in the meadows bursts into colorful bloom. But the idyll can be deceptive. Danger lurks, hiding in wait. A crab spider is on the prowl. Instead of spinning a web, it waits patiently well hidden for its victims. This time, it's unsuccessful. These dramatic scenes of life and death take place in wildflower meadows thousands of times every day. To the south of the Doux region lies the Franche Montagne district, a territory with few people, but an abundance of fields. 
this region is home to an old Swiss horse breed, the Freiburger. Their ancestors came from abroad, but the Freiburger, also called the Franche Montagne horse, has been bred in Switzerland for the past 200 years, and so they are held to be Swiss. Strong, calm, and even-tempered. These were the characteristics that made this horse so popular, especially as a workhorse and for the military. Today, favored as coach horses and for riding, they're the pride of the region. There's enough space in the Franche Montagne for them to spend the entire summer in the fields, almost like the Wild West, except that it's in Switzerland. The Jura often seems to visitors to be a haven of peace. Even in the peak tourist season, there are no hordes of people. Time here often seems to have stood still. The Swiss tourism hotspots aren't far, though. The famous Bernese highlands are just across the way. The best view of their impressive peaks can be had from the Chasseral, one of the Jura's highest mountains. However, at under 2,000 meters, compared with the giants of the Alps, it's something of a dwarf. These animals rarely move away from the alpine region. Marmots. They were brought to the Chasseral in the 1960s. They settled in here quickly. Marmots have been around since the Ice Age and have learned to adapt. Today, there are several colonies along the entire mountain range. Flowers, leaves, or buds. Whatever's juicy, protein-rich, and vegetarian is used to tank up the fat reserves that have been lost during winter. Play fighting strengthens family bonds. But their motto is, stay alert. A shrill whistle sounds the alarm. And they all dive for cover. Not far from the marmots on the barren limestone precipices of the Chasseral, Narcissi and various types of gentian bloom and thrive. They prefer low fertility soils, but these are becoming ever scarcer. Most gentians have one thing in common. To protect themselves from rain or cold air, they close their calyxes. Wild orchids, such as the purple orchid, are also in their element on the poor soils of the mountain fields.
southwest of the Chasserin, the vista opens up to the chains of the Jura mountain range. The limestone rocks and densely forested peaks are characteristic of the region. Jor, or forest, was what the Celts called this area. The name Jura might well have originated from this Celtic word, the forest region. There are many so-called Vutweiden dotted about, wooded pastures that are good for both agriculture and forestry. Known as the Dent de Vaulion, this towering mountain might be regarded as the tooth of time. At its foot lies the Vallée de Joux, home to many famous watch and clockmakers who are the economic backbone of the region. On the high pastures of the Jura Mountains, hikers will often come across dry stone walls. They're a legacy of the ancient Romans who brought the art of dry stone masonry to Central Europe, stone upon stone, with no mortar. For centuries, the walls were used to demarcate land from neighbors or to fence pastures. Many of them were replaced by wire and wood, becoming forgotten relics in time, blending in with their surroundings. Others are properly maintained. Whatever condition they're in, today we know how important they are for plants and animals. Valuable biotopes form inside and around dry stone walls whether small, like this wall lizard, or larger, like this mouse. All creatures appreciate a safe, dry hideaway. Away from the wall, life is much more dangerous. A fox is on the hunt for food, and a mouse like this would suit him perfectly. He searches through the high grass, all his senses honed to catch the slightest movement. Not even the faintest rustle escapes him. He can jump up to six feet into the air to perform his so-called mouse leap. And is sometimes rewarded with a plump water vole. Will he eat it straight away, or take it home to his young, or even store it for later? That's his secret. The mountain meadows of the Dent de Vaulion are a colorful organic home remedy center. Many of the wild flowers growing here are held to have healing properties, such as the columbine. In earlier times, it was said to be effective against scurvy, but also prized as an aphrodisiac. The dead nettle is supposed to help against insomnia. This aerial acrobat seems wide awake though, the hummingbird hawk moth. It's often mistaken for a colibri, as, like the hummingbird, it also hovers. This helps it maintain the right position to suck nectar with its long proboscis. Summer is the main blooming season for meadow flowers. Across the Vallée de Joux, even in July and August, temperatures are mostly moderate because the high valley lies at a thousand meters above sea level. Its showpiece is the eponymous lake, the Lac de Joux. At nine kilometers long, it's the largest lake in the entire Jura Massif.
Not everyone is awake this early in the morning. Although there's a lot to do, it's breeding season for the great crested grebe. A thick reed belt is an ideal spot for its floating nests. Using aquatic plants, twigs and reed stalks, together the couple build a safe home for their eggs. The quiet southwesterly shore of the lake offers good breeding grounds not only for the great crested grebe, it's popular with many other aquatic birds. Insects thrive in the marshy tributary of the Lac de Joux, especially dragonflies. Two become one, the dragonfly's famous mating wheel. Male and female dragonflies can be joined in this reproductive position for up to six hours. This damselfly is still on the lookout for a partner. Blue damselflies are rare as their breeding ground requirements are very specific. The water can't be too warm, so high altitude lakes are ideal. If they feel threatened, the males spread their wings and lift their abdomen to frighten off other dragonflies. But generally speaking, dragonflies are peaceful creatures. The Lac de Joux is fed by the Orbe River that rises in the French part of the Jura Mountains. Here, the river Orb takes its natural course with loops, bends, and curves. This meandering is due to the low gradient of the valley. Moorlands line the banks, making them hard to access. For a long time, the Vallée de Joux was inaccessible, so it was only settled very late. Hardly surprising, as to the west, it's completely sealed off by the Grand Rizou, the largest forested area in Switzerland. 200 years ago, wolves and bears roamed the area. Today, the forest still seems almost impenetrable. It's also the green border separating France and Switzerland. On clear days, Mont Blanc can be seen from here, the highest mountain in the Alps. But size alone isn't the whole story. Some small things are quite impressive too, even very small things. The Vallée de Joux is home to one of the largest colonies of red ants in Europe, with around 20 million insects. Every one of them appears to know exactly what their job is, but who controls the big picture? The intelligence and sensory skills of an individual ant are, to put it kindly, somewhat limited. The secret of this perfectly functioning collective lies in communication, because there's no one single determinant. Ants communicate via pheromones, odoriferous substances that they receive and pass on with their feelers. This enables them to identify members of the same colony, but the best feeding spots, possible sources of danger, ants also get all this information from the scent of others. 
and like a snowball system, the pheromonal cloud of knowledge spreads in a very short space of time. All of this serves a single purpose, survival of the species. The center of the colony is the nest where the queen ant lays her eggs. Fur and spruce needles, twigs and resin, it's all used as construction material for this ant heap. The super colony of the Swiss Jura consists of around 1,200 nests like this, an entire empire, and an impressive wonder of nature in miniature. But the Jura is big on other things too. Another of Switzerland's largest and most impressive natural phenomena is located here. The Creux du Vent. The rocky arena is a geological feature, the result of erosion of the Jura Mountains after the last ice age. At the bottom, in the wooded caldera, there are still remnants of glacial moraines. The sheer rock walls plunge 160 meters down to the valley floor below. It's known as the Swiss Grand Canyon, an imposing monument to time. The caldera is one of the country's oldest nature conservation areas. Up on the plateau's alpine pastures, cows spend their summers. The Creux du Vent is a popular destination for hikers, especially those interested in botany. In addition to the breathtaking views, there's a treasure trove of colorful miscellany the white anemone, yellow globe flower, or the meadow rue or Siberian columbine with its exotic looking umbels. The Creux du Vent's rock faces rise steeply from the dense forests that reach right up to the high plateau. And here, with a little luck, one might encounter an extremely shy inhabitant. The lynx. Its shyness is not unfounded. The relationship between the lynx and humans is a difficult one. At the beginning of the last century, this predator was extinct in Switzerland. In the 1970s, a few pairs were reintroduced, among other areas, in Creux du Vent. In the meantime, the number of lynx in Switzerland has risen, and there is currently heated debate over whether they should be culled to protect the indigenous wildlife. But this feral inhabitant of the Swiss Jura still retains its protected status and luckily has many on its side. The Creux du Vent is situated in the middle of the Val de Travers. It's famous as the home of absinthe. This highly alcoholic drink, known as the Green Fairy, was held to be dangerous and outlawed for a long time. In the fir treetops, blue tits are girding themselves for the coming winter. Now's the time when nature yields all her fruits. In some cases, this can take quite a while. 
it takes 30 years before beech trees bear their fruit. But to make up for it, in some years there's a veritable glut of beech nuts. Oak trees also have boom years for acorns. They're merely ensuring that enough fruit will germinate in the ground. Because most of them are eaten before they do. Hungry forest creatures such as wild boar route out as many acorns and beech nuts as they possibly can in autumn to fatten up for the winter. Autumn is a colorful time. As leaves die, they display their most splendid colors. Many forest dwellers begin to prepare themselves for their imminent winter hibernation. To survive it, the hedgehog has to gorge itself on as much food as possible. And it's not picky. Nuts, snails, beetles, every calorie counts. And the hedgehog is in a hurry. Every day brings fewer hours of sunshine. With less sunshine, leaves stop the process of photosynthesis, which produces their green coloring. They die off and fall. The further autumn advances, the thicker the carpet of fallen leaves becomes. For the fire salamander, this is a signal to begin its search for suitable winter quarters. It won't sleep here, but will be able to find shelter from the first frosts. because these often arrive earlier than expected and without warning, especially in the higher altitudes of the Swiss Jura. And eventually, the time has come. Winter arrives. One region in Switzerland is especially closely linked with the cold season. It's actually quite famous for being cold. La Brévine, a high valley in the canton of Neuchâtel. Because of the valley's isolated location, so-called cold air lakes form here. Cooled air is heavy and stays near the ground. It cannot escape from the hollow of the high valley. People here say that there are only two seasons, winter and the next winter. Minus 40 degrees centigrade has been measured here. Temperatures more likely to occur in Siberia. Not every year is that extreme, but life here is still a challenge for man and beast alike. The thicker the snow cover, the harder it is to find food. A simple and bitter fact not only for this deer. Some creatures clear the way for others, 
Badgers like this one are a rare sight now. It's normally hibernating. So why did this one venture forth? It may well have been woken by hunger. Hunger can make other animals restless too. This fox is looking for stores it set aside during summer because hunting now would require too much energy. So this hair feels quite safe. The grooming process spreads its scent around its whole body, thereby marking its territory. Mobile communication, hair style. Sleeping through the cold months, the survival strategy preferred by many animals. Hollow tree trunks or nesting boxes are good winter quarters for the dormouse. It hibernates from September right through until June, more or less soundly. During hibernation, it loses up to 50% of its body mass. Energy saving is essential. The best motto is, keep calm and carry on sleeping. Winter in the Jura has many faces. Depending on the altitude, it can be covered with deep snow, or sometimes just bare and foggy, like here in the Jura's northeastern tip. The Bishop of Baal had the Bonfol ponds artificially laid out at the end of the 18th century to keep him supplied with fresh carp. Today, these ponds are a nature reserve. In winter, the water temperature can be extremely cold, but there is still enough food for the ducks, so they don't have to move on. Like many other birds, ducks always have cold feet. Their special blood circulation ensures that their body stays warm, but their feet remain cold. This prevents them from sticking to the ice. Back to Swiss Siberia, where winter arrives first and leaves last. Back to La Brévine Valley. Near the village of the same name lies the Lac de Taillère, a typical karst lake. It has no inflow or outflow, maintaining its levels with rainwater and meltwater. The water from the lake seeps away, continuing to flow underground, and then, as if from nowhere, reappearing six kilometers away. Here it emerges from a rock, becoming the source for the river Areuse, the most important river in the canton of Neuchâtel. It supplies 70% of the population with drinking water. At 30 kilometers in length, the Areuse is not a long river, but it's nonetheless impressive. Even smaller bodies of water can excavate, given enough time. The Areuse has inexorably carved through the Jura rock, creating the wild, romantic Areuse Gorge. Our ancestors evidently also felt at home here, the remains of Stone Age cave dwellings have been found in the rocks above the gorge. The first warmer temperatures are an invitation to sunbathe. And for some, to dive. The dipper is one of the few songbirds that can swim and dive. Underwater, it collects insect larvae a tasty snack.
Sooner or later, the cold retreats. Winter is on the wane. And time marches on. A year has gone by. Another ring added to the trunk of the gnarled old oak tree. In its shadow, the world has turned again. And deeply anchored, it continues to defy the rigors of time. Here in the Swiss Jura.